So it's recording. Okay, Let's thanks. Go ahead. I have it here as long as I can make it big enough. Oops. <clears throat> okay, you ready? Um, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, this meeting of the TAC is being conducted via remote participation. All right, thank you. Great. Okay, so. So our first order of business tonight is intro and welcome to our new right member. members. So um, I wanted to just do an introduction both for our guests tonight and then also for the new members, um, including Joe who is here. Tate was unable to attend and he actually just sent me an email that said, um, due to the lack of heat in his apartment in Amherst, which is a situation that recently happened. He expects to have to move to Northampton, so he may not be able oh, to bummer. serve anymore. And he was planning to stay in Amherst, but without any heat, he is not going to be. <laughs> um, so, but I will, um, I'm, I'm going to follow up with the town manager's office and see what we can do about that. But um, Joe, since you're new, would you prefer that we all introduce our, we can all introduce ourselves first and then you can go last. How does that work? For you. Whatever's you convenient can, for you all. Okay. And hello, everybody. Nice to meet and you. And I'm glad too. I can hear you because it says your mic is off, which is just weird. That's weird. I'm um, also, I happen to be in the Caribbean with my family. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, thank you. Thank you for calling in. Connection. Um, okay. So I guess I'll start. Um, so my name is Tracy, and um, I'm the chair of the committee. And um, in my day job, I work at the UMass Transportation Center. We support MassDOT's research program. Um, so, okay, can we just go around? Okay. I'll introduce myself next since I'm already unmuted. Um, I'm Kim Tremblay. I'm a um, professor of, I teach genetics at, at UMass um, and I've been on the TAC for a while. I'm a r avid runner and cyclist and know the streets pretty well. And I've been on the tech for a number of years. Christine. Hi, nice to meet you, Joe. Welcome. Um, I'm Christine and I um, recently joined and I have a particular interest of, um, you know, making sure that the sidewalks and uh, that kids can easily bike and um, walk to and from uh, the schools in the system. And I personally am an avid walker. I walk, um, my average right now is about six miles a day since the beginning of the pandemic. So um, I like it and I live close to downtown so I can keep walking as much as possible. Devon, you want to um, introduce yourself too? Sorry, Trace, was that to me? Yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, I was, it was delayed. Hi, I'm Stefan Cheech. Uh, I started here uh, with the committee on uh, as a member um, in February, early February of last year. Um, in terms of, um, I don't, I, I started late, so sorry, I missed the uh, question, but the question was- uh, It was uh, just main... a quick intro, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, just... My background, uh, yeah, my background is I actually work for UMass Transit Services here and operator for the PBTA. Um, and I also work for the MBTA out in the Eastern Mass. Um, and I just finished uh, two days ago, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> um, a, uh, a role with uh, State Senator Eric Lesser, uh, who's a big component of East-West Rail. So he is out of office as of two days ago, sadly. <laughs> um, so, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully those uh, that initiative will be continued on this year. We have some public meetings set up, so that's exciting. So that is a little bit of background about me. Thank you. And also went to UMass twice. <laughs> so that's also great for the other UMass folks here. Okay. So, um, and Chris and Guilford. I know. Joe, have you met Chris and Guilford? Chris. I'm, I'm Chris uh, Brestrup, planning director. <laughs> Hi. I'm Chris Brestrup, planning director, and I attend these meetings. Guilford is really the staff liaison, but I'm sort of like a secondary staff person. And we appreciate it when you can, which we know planning is very busy. So. I'm Guilford Mooring. I'm the Public Works Director. Okay, great. And then, um, so Joe? Uh, nice to meet everybody. I'm fairly new to Amherst. We love the town. I just had a newborn 
uh, Lucia Monaco. So we've, we've planned to really settle down. Uh, been highly involved in New York City government prior to this uh, city council, Lincoln Wrestler, uh, mostly with issues with the community and stakeholders. So I'm really glad to be here and to participate with you all and to be joining at my first meeting. So really nice to meet you all. Thanks for the introductions. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'll let our guests speak. They can introduce themselves and take it away. Oh, and I'm sorry, Andy, I left you off. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I'm not a member of the committee. I'm Andy Steinberg. I'm a member of the council, councilor at large, and a member of the town services and outreach committee. And uh, in that role, I uh, was uh, designated by the council to be a liaison to the uh, TAC. And uh, I attend as many meetings as I can, and I appreciate all that you are doing, you as a committee are doing for the town. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. So I also want to meet that we have, um, note that we have five attendees in the room. Um, I don't know, I mean, typically in our TAC meetings, you know, we let people in um, so that they can like fully participate and see us fully and, um, but, um, and see each other as well. Um, do people feel comfortable doing that? Um, and, and that way too, they can more fully participate. I know that um, one reason that the PVPC is here and MassDOT's here is to get feedback on the long range plans. Um, so if everybody's okay with that, I say we do that. Um, and also there are a number of representatives of the attendees who are here from the Disability Access Advisory Committee. I had reached out to their chair to just mention that um, MassDOT and PVPC would be here today and, and to invite them to come, so. I'm okay with it. Okay, everybody. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll let them in. Thank you, Guilford. So remove, remove. Oh, I'm I'm promoting. Sorry. Promoting. Don't remove them, and then they'll get kicked out forever. Come on. <laughs> You're still making bad Zoom jokes, Guilford. I'm I'm shocked after years <laughs> of using Zoom now. <laughs> oh, it's great. Try to get your last three can, I guess. Um, there's two more. All right, one more. Carl should be there. They're all in. Yeah, he's a student. So, okay, great. All right, welcome everybody. Um, and then I know that I had put the public comment period um after the presentation and the discussion today with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and Mass DOT. Um. But I'd also just, in case anybody was here and they just wanted to make any brief comments, I mean, I'm assuming most people are here for the presentations and that discussion, but um, would people be okay if we just offered just the opportunity? Because I know that um, sure. this outreach segment is expected to take a good hour or something. <laughs> so if somebody just had something really quick they wanted to share with us, um, I'd be okay with that. If any of you do, do you want to just go ahead and raise your hand? Yeah, Meg, you can go ahead. We can't hear you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Meg Gage. <clears throat> I live on Montague Road in North Amherst. And I am here to uh, re uh, reiterate something I sent in the email I wrote to the TAC yesterday to ask if we, uh, su we've submitted four excellent uh, proposals uh, for resident capital projects. Uh, they're all quite modest and they're all related to transportation. And we've been encouraged to get your advice about them uh, sooner rather than later. And we would love to be on your agenda on your next meeting on the 19th. They have to do with, I mean, my feeling about transportation and I'm so admiring of the <clears throat> bicycle pedestrian network plan from 2019 and also the uh, best practices report that y'all did two or three years ago, uh, we feel that the proposals are all aligned with that. Uh, we're not gonna fix all of our transportation issues with any one thing. It's gonna be this and that and this and that with sidewalks and bike paths and uh, other safety mechanisms. So we have four modest proposals uh, to that end. And we'd love to share those with you at your next meeting as in your role as advisory. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you. The A, so, the A in tech. <laughs> okay, awesome. thank you for that. Um, any other comments? 
Just Tracy, I have another hard stop at um at six thirty in case there's any need okay. to vote on stuff. Maybe. Yeah, like I don't meet the minutes. Maybe we can just put put all the <sighs> minutes in the next meeting. That that would be fine with me. Um, I appreciate Amber getting them all to us. Um, okay. So I think um I mean Andy, you don't have any other meetings like after this one right away. You don't have TSO tonight, right? I can't hear you. You're muted. You're Correct. Muted. I do not. Okay. So I think um at the end of the meeting we could just the question that Meg is asking just about because you're on JCPC, right? About um like the role of TAC, of any, in terms of reviewing citizen requests and providing input or anything would be helpful if you have any thoughts on that. But I, I do wanted to get ahead to the presentations and the discussion, the main discussion. Thank you. Okay, so um, sorry about the delay, but um, Miranda and Gary, go ahead, take it away. Hi, my name is Gary Rue. I'm a transportation planner with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And uh, I'm going to let Miranda from MassDOT introduce the whole concept of why we asked to be part of your agenda tonight. So go ahead, Miranda. Hi, my name is Miranda. Um, I work for MassDOT in the Office of Transportation Planning um, in downtown Boston. Um, I'm actually stepping in for uh, co-worker Chris Clem, who's a regional planning coordinator and works with um, your all's region um, in his day to day. Um, he's just out on vacation. But um, so I actually manage some of our federal programs, and one of which is uh, the long range transportation plan, which is done uh, periodically, it's federally mandated. And the plan that we're putting together right now is called Beyond Mobility 2050. Um, so this document that is being put together through engagements like this and other outreach throughout the year um, is being put together as a sort of strategic plan um, guiding um, transportation decision makers in um, how they should how investments should be made between now and 2050 um, throughout our transportation system so whether that's transit um, roadways bicycle and pedestrian facilities, um, you name it. Um, this sort of uh, plan will be the guideline over the next 27 years um, about where investments should be made and why. Um, and so through focus groups and outreach like this, we're putting together um, vision and value statements um, that will help guide the planning process. And we're also looking to hear from people about what barriers exist to you using um, transportation options that are available to you or not available to you, um, what else you need and want from your transportation system, whether that's you know improved connectivity, reliability, safety. Um, so um, sort of putting that into like barriers and needs. Um, and with all the feedback that we're getting um, and public input, we're updating our own um, data and um, assumptions and things that we've put into the plan um, and making sure that what we've understood um, aligns with what we're hearing from the public um, and establishing, you know, shared priorities. Um, we do have some priority areas sort of set um, as a way to sort of influence or guide our plan, which is safety, connectivity and access, the travel experience, reliability, car-free travel, resiliency, technology and electrification. Uh, so that was a lot. And of course, I can always, you know, repeat those and drop those in the chat again. Um, and that said, a lot of our conversation today, the goal is really just to, um, we have some questions that we can use to like prompt the discussion, but also feel free to, if there's something um, I haven't mentioned um, that you want to make sure gets um, attention and prioritized, please like the sky's the limit. Um, you know, I think we'd rather have more comments and more feedback from the public, um, just so we can, you know, take it to decision makers and that, you know, a new administration, um, and say, like, this is what we're hearing from the people who live, work, and move around the Commonwealth. So, um, and this is how we need to support them. Uh, sorry, that was a long intro, but um, yeah, I don't know if we were gonna share slides, Gary, or I don't know if you want to share um, a bit on how 
this yeah so i uh, we we have a um presentation that that we'll be using to, to guide this and, and as a companion to uh the state transportation plan beyond mobility the pioneer valley planning commission has uh, again as a federal requirement uh to the requirement to update our regional transportation plan so we're actually in the process of updating our transportation plan and i i really feel that most of the uh, comments that would be given as part of a state transportation plan would apply to a regional transportation plan as well. So we we saw value in partnering with MassDOT. They saw value in partnering with the regions. They're doing this all across uh, the state. And we're uh, trying to, to get that feedback as content for our long range plan updates. So uh, I did have a question as far as um, there's a companion online survey that goes along with this is there a way i can share the link um i think when we're in this meeting format i don't i don't think you can i don't know guilford can you um i, I don't think they, these meetings are set up to have any chat they're you know yeah. they're, they're like set up in a format by the town but gary if you want to email it to me then i can make sure that everybody who's in attendance today receives it I, I did have it. Uh, I did email it to you earlier today. Oh, okay. So you should have it, Tracy. Okay, great. That's perfect. Sorry, well, I'll, I, I, I'll, I'll share my screen now. I had a one-hour appointment that took way longer because everything was behind. But thank you. And also, I do also remember that um, beyond mobility, that there were two rounds of surveys, Miranda. And when I went looking for that second survey, I wasn't able to find it. Is that still active or is that now being tabulated? It, um, it might be being um, sort of analyzed now, um, okay. but I think it might have been taken down. Okay. There's a good chance we either do, we're definitely doing another public meeting, um, probably in the summer, fall, once we put together everything. And I know that we're also, we may consider doing another survey as well once we put out some preliminary things. Okay, great, thank you. So um, Miranda, the, the, a lot of the first slides are just um, kind of giving the overview of Beyond Mobility. Um, and I'll stop on the, um, we, we also have this information that we can share with you, Tracy, the, the entire presentation that has all these links mm -hmm. uh, as well. So yeah, uh, I yeah, I sent out to the committee members, I sent out a link to the bond mobility site. Um, but I didn't send out this presentation specifically. But yes, you did provide it to me. Thanks. Right. So so that's all we're, we're seeing on this slide. And then you have the uh, follow up information for MassDOT on this slide as well. Um, and this is just uh, summarizing what Miranda already explained of, of what the purpose of these long range plans are, their vision for the future of transportation and uh, our guidebook as we develop projects and, and planning projects. So, so not only construction projects, but studies that might be undertaken at the regional or state level in terms of transportation are, are all parts of how the transportation plan guides us uh, into the future. Uh, so again, this is a part of the public participation process. These plans are developed over several months. It's not the only opportunity for public engagement. We will continue to, to take engagement throughout the development of, of both documents. And it, it's important that as you think of things that you, you contact us and, and uh, get us your, uh, your thoughts and your feedback. <laughs> And what we're doing with the feedback, so again, something Miranda already summarized, but it, it's shaping the vision statements, the problem statements, and the goals of these documents. And then we're making sure that we're sharing it with the decision makers in, in the, not only at the state level, but at the regional level. And this, so this next part is intended to be more discussion and answer. Uh, it is based on the assumption that you've taken uh, this survey or you're taking it along with it, but I, I think uh, we'll just keep this informal and uh, we're, we're looking for uh, your thoughts. And there's about nine questions, maybe 10, but uh, really any uh, transportation related items are, are what we're interested in hearing about. 
this is the link to the survey. Um, so uh, again, if, if you uh, want to try to follow along, I, it's up to you, but I'm feeling like it'd just be better. What do you think, Miranda? Just be better to try to, to go without it? Yeah, I mean, like I, our staff doesn't directly have access. This is our, our consultants link. Um, and I think some of the questions might be helpful, but if you all feel like you'd rather give more like anecdotal data and examples, we can definitely just use the questions as like jumping off points. Great. So the first general question is, what's the most important features to improve on our roadways and why? And Gary, if you go to the next slide, it should show the options. Oh yeah, that's, yeah. thank you. Thank you. So, so these are the options um, that are in the survey. And, you know, it's a select all that apply type of option for the survey, but I, there is another category that's not showing up as well. So if something's not shown, that, that'd be important to, to uh, share with us as well. So I think um, the la I did pull up the consultants version and the only category that's not showing is other. So on this one. Thank you. So we're okay with that, I think. Um, if anybody has any thoughts, any of the committee members or other attendees have any thoughts on any of these. So. Well, I, I guess, you know, um, uh, particularly with the new law, I think that just went into place, right, with the um, cyclists and pedestrians and other people using the roads having a four foot wide um, berth from cars and whatever. I think it's really important that a lot of a lot of roadways, as you know, around New England are just very narrow. Um, and, and a lot of us, especially out here in Western Mass, live out on these narrow roads and it makes it that makes it very difficult to cycle places or for those of us who are a little less adventurous than I am. And uh, so, so I feel like that's really needed, you know, to increase the infrastructure for um, walking and cycling, um, particularly out here where we have narrow roads. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and there's a hand up from the um, audience. Jessica, do you like, you, I think you have to unmute yourself. Thanks. Um, I would like to uh, endorse the idea of safety for vulnerable travelers, um, but I would like also for us not to think about widening roads um, because widening roads invites cars to go faster. Um, so if we could not widen roads and keep traffic speeds down um, and build pedestrian and bicycle safe um, accessory units onto the uh, roads, I think that would be a very wonderful thing. Thank you. It's a good point. And um, next, Guilford had his hand up. Hi, I just wanted to I put in that I really appreciate you guys saying that we need to make more accommodation space for this these types of transportation things. But one of the things we keep running up repetitively, especially because we're a rural area, is we rule we run into conservation restrictions, yeah. which don't allow you to put sidewalks on conservation land. We run mm -hmm. up against APR properties, which don't allow you to put sidewalks on APR land without some type of compensation which actually for our small layouts really hampers what we can do out here in the Western part of the state. So there's many directives that MassDOT has handed down saying you'll have sidewalks on both sides, you'll have complete streets, but if you don't have the layout and you can't even buy the layout because it's in conservation or as an APR land, it really restricts you. So there needs to be some type of discussion among the state stakeholders about how to accommodate people's need for walking or cycling off the roadways, but then have it so that you can use some of this other land we have, because otherwise you just can't, you can't widen some of these roads to even put sidewalks or bike paths on the sides of the roads because of these restrictions. Guilford, is it as simple as 
you know, allowing uh, alteration of, of, of some of the example properties that you said when, when you can demonstrate it's not going to be an impact and it's going to be for, say, public safety benefits? Yes, it is. I mean, we have one project we did in Amherst, which was Pine Street, um, and we we added a sidewalk to the side of Pine Street, but half the sidewalk is actually an APR land. Uh, and the APR people are like, well, it's a small, it's a small taking. It's okay, you can put it over there. Um, but then when the conservation people, we talk to them, they're a little less willing to go on conservation land. So sometimes it is just the matter of being allowed to go on the land with the sidewalk or the multi-use path. And yeah, thank you. Um, and if at least can speak, I'll speak after. But also, Eve Vogel did come as an as an attendee. Guilford, if you could also elevate her to be the panelist. And our and there's one more person with their hand up whose name I am forgetting. It's Elise, her name is Elise. No, no. Um, is there anybody else? Maybe. Oh yeah, Elise. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Elise? Am I allowed to ask a question since I'm not on the committee? Yeah, I mean, this is a public outreach section okay. of the meeting. F um, hi, um, thank you for um, inviting me in. I, there is um, something I've thought about a lot and has been an issue a huge safety issue, and that is bus stops and sidewalks, bus stops in particular not being shoveled, um, is a huge safety issue. And I would like to see something happen about that. Um, I've seen people, I've nearly fallen, and I've seen people, you know, even with my crappy vision, I'm vision and I'm legally blind, but I, I've seen people nearly fall. Um, and those of us, many of us are, seniors and disabled people who use public transportation. And so that's, that's, I'm just putting in my two cents. Thank you for listening. So essentially you're saying upkeep of, of our yeah. spaces, our road spaces, particularly, I mean, that's an issue for, for cycling, for any, anyone who is not a driver. It's the, the snow shoveling, especially. Yeah. I mean, there are so many times there's a snowstorm and yeah. the bus stops get ignored. They're, they're just neglected. So that and I think like to see that. that's really important, actually, you know, I mean, we see that a lot in town as well. And, and, and I mean, it just goes to the greater use of, so it's not just providing the facilities, it's keeping them, maintaining them and putting in money for those kinds of things. Otherwise, they just simply don't get used. Yeah, somebody's going to get hurt. <laughs> yeah, but that, I think that's really important. Thank you. Thank you. It, um, if there are no other, Tracy, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. I, I had a comment and Elise, um, a question too. Hand down? Thank you. So one of the things is that, well, on terms of the um, sidewalk clearing issue is so one thing that um, that I see as a challenge that we've seen like locally, including in Hadley, which is outside of our jurisdiction, but and something I think about a lot anyway, is that I mean, the state DOT has policies that are great for encouraging complete streets when there's big road redesigns, such as along Route 9. But then there can sometimes be issues, particularly in smaller communities that don't have a lot of DPW staffing and so on, in terms of making sure that if you are going to build facilities, pedestrian sidewalks and bike lanes and so on, that they are maintained, like they are cleared in the winter. Um, because I believe this is now like the fifth winter since that one segment of sidewalk along Route 9 from the Amherst Hadley line on University Drive to the Hampshire Mall um, was built, which is a fabulous facility. But in the winter, there's really nobody taking ownership or responsibility for keeping that clear. And um, I can, I'm can i concerned about that both with that segment, but also the new segment, which is the new Mass DOT project that's going from um, South Maple Street, like to the center of Hadley, you know, just in terms of a bigger issue is, I think it's great to have the commitment to expand the facilities in that way, but just to make sure that they are maintained and accessible throughout the year. And I mean, I do understand that MassDOT now has 
some grant programs to help like fund snow plowing equipment for sidewalks and stuff, which is a start. But I'm just, it seems like a longer potential issue. Um, yeah. and, and just on the question about um, the new um, legislative act that passed with, in terms of um, keeping the distance for bikes and pedestrians along roadways. I mean, one thing that some people have been reaching out to me and asking about is just whether that means if you have to have the four foot clearance, whether that might lead there to be fewer of those facilities just if, he, if on narrower roadways, if, he, if the argument's gonna be like, there's not sufficient room, which I hope that's not the case. Um, but I think it, it would be worth exploring like what the ramifications of that are. So, I mean, it, it is an act to promote safety. And so I think that's really important. And as somebody who walks and bikes along Roadways, I mean, there are times, right, when you can be completely squeezed by the cars trying to pass you in the lane instead of, like, moving over. So I appreciate all the safety aspects of that, but but in just in terms of, um, so maybe that's something that could be explored both in the regional plan and as well as the state plan. Yeah, I, I think it would be great to have some better education on that new law. I know there's been a lot of media on it, but I, I share some of your questions, Tracy. And I think it's just something that if we're going to see the maximum benefit of that law, people need to understand it. Yeah. Um, I also, I guess I also just wanted to say that um, it seems really important that another, and I guess since this is just an open comment, I feel important to say that we should have more EV charging stations around if that's, if it seems like that's the way everything is going. And in the absence of having charging stations, you're not going to encourage more people to have electric vehicles in the absence of charging stations. So that seems super important as well. Great. Let's move on to the next uh, question. And that's more in lines of the features of our transit network. So it's what are the most important features to improve on our transit network. This includes rail, subway buses, and shuttle services. Uh, some of the options are more frequent bus service, more frequent subway service, we don't have that, uh, or commuter rail at the moment, more passenger rail options, uh, community shuttle, service, shuttle services that would get people to and from and around major activity centers, encouragement of carpooling and ride sharing, improved paratransit service, and uh, of course, another category. Are there any comments from anybody? Joe, Joe has a question, uh, a comment. Hi, yeah, so for this option, um, I think one item to highlight would be uh, grocery deserts that are found in areas such as Springfield and uh, Chicopee. I think that should be definitely a priority since in the plan, it's a priority to reach out to uh, communities that have not really received that sort of uh, response to their feedback. Uh, one interesting area that I hadn't thought of before that's on this list are shuttle services. I don't know if they're cost prohibitive, uh, but if you really use data to line that up with the economic benefit of doing so, it, that might be something to think about, especially in highly concentrated areas such as Springfield um, or Chicopee. Thank you. Eve. Eve? Sorry, I'm just having a hard time figuring out where my unmute button was. Found it. Um, just based on when I was involved in the TAC a few years ago when we did the comprehensive service analysis, I just thought I'd mention a few things that I remember coming up um, <clears throat> and things that I've seen. So one thing is in, in places like Amherst and some other places, we have a lot of bus stops that are on major roads with no um, landing. And that means they're, you know, you can't use them if you're a child, you can't use them if you're disabled, you can't, you, you know, there's a lot of, um, so anyway, that's just one thing that just in a lot of areas um, just limits who can use and benefit from buses. Um, another thing you probably know is that much of the PBTA runs on college schedules. 
And so one of the big challenges for us is always what happens in January. I personally used to um, bike or bus my child to daycare and, you know, we could bike in the summer and bike in the spring, but not in January. So that there was a real gap in January that um, was problematic. Um, and then there's always talk about how the heck do we get people to HCC and GCC? And from places like Amherst, there's really bad transit. It's like a two hour ride at least with a transfer along the way to get from Amherst to one of the community colleges. And so those are um, things that always come up. Thank you. Christine. Um, I don't need to <clears throat> repeat what Eve just said, but thank you. Um, the idea that my daughter would have to get off, you know, on a major road. Um, she's just now starting to take the PBTA. Um, you know, that becomes a consideration and whether or not I'll let her <laughs> do that um, unless there's a dedicated landing and a sidewalk from there. So I'll just bump what Eve said. Um, <clears throat> and also along the college schedule, sometimes it's just hard for her to get from point A to B. Last, I'll state the obvious, which is the, um, the rail east to west, west to east. <laughs> um, you know, there are lots of people who live in Amherst who work in Boston um who are you know contributing to greenhouse gas pollution and otherwise you know having to be another car on the road at least for some of that commute back and forth because of the um the lack of a kind of straight shot to get there so i just felt like again the obvious needed to be stated <clears throat> great anybody else I mean, I can weigh in with a few thoughts. Um, I wasn't going to talk about the inf the infrastructure itself and not the service, but I mean, Eve, I mean, the raised some interesting points to say, Christine, about um, just the landing area. But then also, um, one thing I've noticed recently is that a lot of the bus stops in our area that even have that do have shelters that there's not always lighting near them, either street lighting or lighting within the bus shelter itself, and it seems like. You know, especially with newer technology or something, at least like people could not be sitting in the dark. Um, and also, if you are using those bus shelters that are completely dark, like I was on um, East Pleasant Street last night. Um, the District 4 counselors had arranged like a walking tour along East Pleasant Street from Kendrick Park up to Strong Street. And we noticed that the bus shelter that's across the street, which is at um, just a place that you can't see that bus shelter at all if you're on the other side of the street. So like if it was a new thing, if you know if you were taking it for the first time, you wouldn't even necessarily know it was there. And then also to make sure that the buses, that the bus drivers are going to stop for you. Um, because I know like I've had my teenagers have sometimes um, been supposed to take the bus from routes that don't run very often. And if the bus driver doesn't see them, then they need to wait. You know, they either need to like shout down the bus or they need to like wait a whole other hour for the next time. Um, and one thing I think about too, in terms of the services is just, and this is something I've thought about ever since I moved to Amherst 20 years ago, but just some of the connectivity, you know, with other towns, particularly with Amherst, like the disconnect with Hadley sometimes is um, like we have a low income area off East Hadley Road and the apartments go up close to the Amherst Hadley line. But then there's no direct service that goes from those apartment complexes to, for example, the Hampshire Mall. Um, and a lot of people will like walk through the fields or walk on the roads without any sidewalks and things like that. But in order for them to take the, the bus service, they need to go back into the center of Amherst. Like it's a very long route when it's actually just a few miles. And I mean, that could be because of the relationship with Hadley or something, but maybe in some cases when those kind of those connections are so important if there's like regional funding to help support those beyond municipal funding and like that seems important. I mean, just and two, as Eve was talking about just the community colleges. Um, I used to work in Greenfield in downtown Greenfield and I know that I could bike faster 
um, to Greenfield. I'm not even a fast bicyclist and I could get there on the bus. <laughs> so like the bus ride was well over an hour, you know, or an hour and a half or something. And so if we want to encourage, you know, both for jobs and training and education and so on, but also just to improve those connections. So thanks. And I think Eve put her hand back up. Or not. I did. Um, one, I just wanted to say in terms of getting data and ideas about routes, needed routes and needed hours, one of the things that happened in the comprehensive service analysis was that the surveys went out to existing bus riders um, and, to, uh, and to known community groups. And the problem with that was that in some cases there were apartment complexes or communities or kinds of needs that were not being served and people weren't riding the bus because it didn't exist. And there was no way for those needs to sort of, you know, kind of literally get on the map. Um, so just as, as you think about, you know, setting up some kind of template for figuring out where new routes and new schedules are needed, keep in mind that you might need to survey people who are not currently being served. That's a good point. It's something that I know that PVTA has talked about, but I honestly don't know if they have plans for doing that in the near future. So um, we'll certainly make sure they hear that comment. Well, I just mentioned too, Eve, I don't know if you were at the meeting, but um, we did have the UMass graduate students who are like working on the PVTA, like updated service plan, strategic plan. Um, come to one of our TAC meetings a few months ago, and that topic came up about the needs to also reach out to the other communities as well, so. Okay. Should we move on? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the next is, uh, what types of transportation improvement should be funded? Uh, so we're talking about pedestrian and bike connections to transit stations, bike sharing stations, uh, bus only lanes connecting to transit stations and major activity centers, bicycle or driver parking at, at stations. Uh, Miranda, I assume that means uh, commuter rail stations and then uh, wayfinding at transit stations and, and other. Can we say yes to all of those? All buttons? of the above, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, <laughs> if anybody has like specific priorities, but they all seem important. Okay, I guess right. if there are no comments, we can move on. Thank you. So what type of improvements are most important for the state to spend funding on? I, I, just more of a, you you rather see more you know non motorized projects or would you rather see more roadway projects i think a lot of the purview of the committee is really um towards the um non roadway <laughs> projects more transit and bike pad but um wait this is a lot christine is your hand raised no. Yeah, but okay. um, I think Guilford and Jessica were before me. Okay, Guilford. I would say other. We just need to maintain what we have because maintain. we build stuff and we don't maintain it. Yeah. I mean, buses will last longer if the roads are resurfaced. So, and you can ride in the road easier if it's resurfaced. If we don't give more money and get rid of all the stupid strings that are being attached to this money, and there's no reason to spend two thirds of a project cost <clears throat> competing to win on, win money from mass DOT. Just divide the money up evenly. We've always said chapter 90 formula is a great way to divide the money up. Give it to us with no, with no strings attached, except for you have to spend it on maintenance and let us, let us do the job that way. Jessica. Hi. Um, I would prefer that money go to um, non-roadway projects. Um, I think that we really in Massachusetts as elsewhere um, need to encourage people to walk, to bike, to take the bus, to do all of the things that we've been, that the committee's been talking about and this presentation is about. 
And the only way to do that is to make it convenient, uh, safe, and affordable for people to do that and less affordable for them to drive their cars. So not maintaining the roadways, I know, I know that this is a, won't be popular, um, but you don't need speed bumps if you've got potholes <laughs> in your roads. So um, there's a savings right there. Thank you. And I think the next is um, Tracy and then Joe. Oh, I'll go ahead and speak last since I've talked before. Okay, Joe, please. Uh, so for my, my bid would be for, since this is a long-term plan, would be to high-speed rail and uh, just to looking towards the North Atlantic uh, rail initiatives that some of the governments are working towards if this is interstate. So I just, I was curious where MassDOT is on that currently. I'm sorry, I'm not the one for that question. I started like four months ago. Um, you know, it, rail yeah, I, sounds, sounds great, but unfortunately I don't, I'm not in charge. Otherwise we'd be having a very different conversation right now. I, I, I'm not even the rail person at Pioneer Valley, but I, I think if there were a real interest by your committee, uh, I know I could get somebody from our agency to come to a future meeting and, and give you an update on, on where things stand, at least how we're seeing it from our planning staff. Yeah, that would be great at some point. We did have um, somebody come from the rail, East West Rail Initiative from like um, trains in the valley came and spoke to us. So that was helpful, but it would be great to get an update at some point. And um, great. Saren? I, uh, I'm a member of Disability Access Advisory Committee. And um, one thing that was, that we realized was some of the uh, leisure activities the town was providing uh, needed some bus services. So they were doing trips to areas. However, those of us with mobility impairments were not able to use those systems. So my wish would be like all buses running in Massachusetts, whether they're for public transportation or for leased vehicles should be accessible for people with disabilities. If we're looking into long range wish lists. Cool. Thank you. Great. And um, Sarah, uh, Tracy? Yeah, so, I mean, my comment um, in terms of roadways and part of it was to respond to Jessica, who I guess I don't see her anymore. Maybe she's still here. But one of the things is that not just to think about like expanded roadways, but I see, you know, funding for roadways. It's also being ways to make intersections safer, to make the existing streets safer. <laughs> and as Guilford talked about, to also maintain what we have. <laughs> You know, the pots of money for building new infrastructure and for maintaining existing infrastructure are often different, but the maintenance is such a huge thing. Like even in Amherst, where we have been building new sidewalks and things, if we don't maintain them, you know, they're not going to be that accessible. So, I mean, I think they're all important, but I, did, I don't see the roadways as only just being about moving vehicles faster. Like I also see them as important infrastructure for all the other modes as well. Yeah, these categories are a bit broad, um, which uh, if you're not familiar with like what we classify roadways under, like to your point, Tracy, intersections and other safety is considered in that. Yeah, so if we want to go on, I guess. Okay, uh, so what are the types, any types of destinations that need better transportation connections and which are most in need? So access to jobs, food, health care, parks and open space, education, public housing, or other? Shopping. Food, yeah. Okay. And I like the idea too of shuttles, you know, for some of these, like as Eve was asking about like GCC and HCC or, um, you know, for example, healthcare and things like that. So instead of just being part of like the regular bus system, 
or the van service system, which can end up taking hours, you know, to go from Amherst to Bay yeah. State, for example. Like if there could be, you know, funding for different shuttles. I mean, there are some to a certain extent, like through the paratransit system, but maybe to increase some of the efficiencies with that. And also for other people who don't qualify for the paratransit, but who are still um, transit dependent to like be able to better access some of those, so. Um, Christine. Yeah, I mean, here in Amherst, some, even some local town services, I'm just thinking specifically the um, library in South Amherst, you know, you can't get there from here. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, th those, we would just be thoughtful about current existing services and how people can walk or bike or roll to them. Um, and then, um, similarly, you know, the, the notch, um, Holyoke Range State Park, I mean, it's always been strange to me that you can't really walk or bike there, um, you know, you can hike there, but, uh, you know, in terms of just encouraging folks to use the facilities. So I know that's under parks and open space, but I think, um, I think Holyoke Range is maybe the top most visited state park in the whole um, statewide system. I'm not positive about that, but I think um, spending time to, uh, make th those particularly popular places um, more accessible would um, be good bang for the buck. So for Miranda's benefit, since I know she's not from this area, uh, <laughs> that location is, is on Route 116 and it's basically at the top of the hill it is your parking and access area to a lot of the trails, uh, very popular hiking area. And uh, you, you really, um, can't bike that hill unless you're a, a quite advanced rider. Yeah, and there is a sidewalk, but it only goes halfway, <laughs> halfway up. Um, Christine, breast strip. Okay. So I just wanted to let you know that there is a plan to improve the trail that goes from Vista Terrace, which is a new subdivision near Atkins Farm. Um, the town just acquired a plot of land there that I think is seven acres. And there's going to be a connection to the trolley line that goes up to the notch. So there will be a place to park off the Vista Terrace roadway and um, a way to get to this old trolley line, which is going to be improved eventually. I think it's walkable now. And then that goes up to the notch. So you don't absolutely have to go up 116 on your bicycle, you'll be able to park at Vista Terrace and walk. So if that's what a great point. news. Thank you, Christine Brestra. Okay. <laughs> Do you have a date when you think that might be started, Christine? Well, we just acquired the property um, from the developer uh, to provide the parking and um, access. And we already have the trolley line as open space. So um, you know, it's kind of an ongoing project. The access to it is now in place. Thank you. Should we move on? Yes. Yeah, I would just actually, I would just add in terms of connections about like the e-bike system and Valley bikes, for example, is, um, I mean, it seems like a great resource, you know, it can supplement what's happening with the transit system and for people who are um, dependent on transit or walking, biking, um, and it makes, you know, hilly rides more possible and things, but there are, it would be great to see the number of stations expanded, including in Hadley, um, just because there are a number of places where if, if there were um, stations where you could park there, like that would be really helpful, like the, you know, Hadley, um, Hampshire Mall and Mountain Farms and other types of destinations, you know, to expand the types of trips that people could make. So, so there is a expansion project on the tip. Um, I'm, I'm going from memory, maybe another 10 uh, stations. 
Hadley has been discussed, but I don't believe it's part of the proposed expansion at this time. I mean, it seems like the Hadley um, Select Board is not that supportive, you know, in terms of like the local share. Um, but I guess in some cases, just like with the bus system, if there, you know, are regional benefits for the regional transportation, um, then you know maybe there's ways to finesse that or something. I don't. But I mean, I would think other smaller towns might feel the same, but they are just such important connection places. Right now, the, the plan for Hadley would be a public-private partnership where they, they would have a station uh, probably behind the Walmart and, and uh, you know, some type of agreement where, where they allow that, uh, but it has not been finalized, and I don't well, know that it's part of this project moving forward. But I know that um, L.O. Bean, so we had somebody from Valley Bike come and speak to the TAC in the fall, and... They were talking about L.L. Bean being real, willing to subsidize it, but. Cool. Great. Okay, move on. Mm -hmm. So when funding transportation, how important is it to consider equity and fairness? Um, so scale of one to five with five being the best. Christine Brestrup. I would say it's extremely important because um, people who are low income um, have less opportunity to own cars and therefore need to rely on transportation, public transportation to get where they're going. So it's obviously very important for them to have better transportation. I was also going to say five, um, and not only do they have less access to transportation, but they have less access to meetings like this. So they needed they need to be considered more on the ground. Um, just from or just wanted to add that, like from hearing everyone's comments, I would deduce everyone would say five. Um, so if you wanted to add any context of not just thinking about equity in terms of um, income, but you know, geographically, um, this is you know a statewide plan. Like, what are things that you all feel like in your location might not get as much um, airtime or investment, um, and just equity in a broad sense of the term and in different um, dimensions. So, just wanted to add that um, to help prompt well, any thoughts. Yeah, and I think I think to your point, um, you know it's very clear that we need an east-west rail connection that needs to extend out here. Um, so I think we all are in agreement with that too. I mean, we're just lacking out here. We don't get, we don't get the end, you know, we're the, we're the end of the, of the trail. We need it out here. Well, and I mean, and, you know, beyond us, right, there's more Western mass, like you look at Berkshire <laughs> County and so on. So I do think that geographic equity is important, you know, in terms of distribution of resources and support for things in Western Mass. So, so that kind of plays into the next question, which is how important is con considered connectivity and coverage to the places people need to go? And again, it's a one to five. I mean, the connectivity is so essential, right? Because otherwise the trips don't work, so. Yeah, and I think, you know, the reason I jumped to this is because it, it seems to fall right in line with your, um, you know, commenting on the importance of, of rail access uh, out in uh, the Western part of the state. Um, are there other types of transportation improvements that, that you feel lack that connectivity? Yeah, I'm thinking of like, there's so many people that are just in slightly outlying areas of town or slightly outlying towns. Um, you know, housing is just insanely expensive these days and that's just becoming more and more the reality. And um, most places you have to drive, but that has huge cost to it. So I see it as like, it just makes 
It makes, uh, yeah, getting that geographic coverage and making it possible for people to take transit or bicycle safely with an e-bike, you know, which makes, you know, an e-bike can make a five mile trip doable instead of just a one mile trip. So there, there are just like, there's all kinds of ways that because because of housing unaffordability, people are more dispersed and that that becomes even more important. And I guess one thing with the e-bikes too is our, like the Valley bike, it shuts down for, for the whole winter. So I don't know. I mean, there are other e-bike systems, including urban areas where they keep them going, you know, so for people who are using that for primary transportation needs, like that's not going to work out here for those months of the year. I also wanted to just add as a bicyclist, you know, I've been a bicyclist who's taken my kid on a tag along and a lot of times and places and a lot of the bike facilities out and sort of rural roads are really only made for like really strong big adults um, who are highly visible and so it's also a kind of an equity issue in terms of just making facilities that are, you know, feel safe for women that have enough light, um, that feel safe for parents to take their kids on a tag along, that feel safe for elderly people to be able to learn how to ride a e-trike, you know, there, there's just like a lot of different alternatives that rely on intersections, it, like those, those linkage points, right, those connectivity points are the things that are going to make it seem like there's no, no way I'm going to let my child do that. There's no way I'm going to try to walk out there, you know, kind of thing. So those things are actually really important. Okay, thank you. Um, last, uh, when funding transportation, how important is it to consider reliability and limiting unexpected delays. And again, you don't have to rank it one to five. I, I think just uh, examples of the unreliability you might see in the existing transportation system, um, unexpected delays that, that you ha encounter a as you're trying to do your normal commute or uh, travel to and from say uh, an appointment or shopping. I feel like our, our networks out here are pretty fairly reliable, except for the point that Eve made previously, which is we just it it plummets when students aren't here. We have no, we have a lack of service when there's not student when they're, you know, during the summer and during the um the now the extended win January term. Um, what about options to get? to say uh, an airport from Amherst. Oh yeah. That's oh, we don't really have that. <laughs> I tr I've tried. Yeah, there it's, are no. It, it's pretty complicated and expensive. But perhaps that's something we should rally for because we all feel like that it's so silly that we, I have, we have to drive to these places. It seems ridiculous. Um, and Jessica has a hand up. Please don't put an airport in Amherst. Please, please, no. please. We need to re we need to keep our open land open for agriculture because the climate refugees are coming. <laughs> so please, no airports here. We're not no. proposing an airport. We're just proposing better connectivity to airports. Yes. I mean, when I've looked up on Google Maps, if I get, you know, when I've taken certain trips, if I was like flying into Bradley late at night and I was transit dependent, it would tell me to stay overnight in Springfield and like take the bus the next day, basically. So there's a lot of added costs. And I've gotten the same messages for flying into Logan and things, you know, there's really limited connections, which some of that could be met with shuttle services or private market. Um, a number of the private market options to provide shuttles to airports in the urban areas like Boston and New York disappeared over COVID. Some mm -hmm. are coming back, but it would be nice if there were more of them. And um, Christine, you had your hand up and then Joe. Me, Christine? Yes, sorry. So, um, well, we do have Valley Transporter and that has come back since COVID. So I'm very glad to report that. And that is a private um, organization that provides rides to airports, it's very expensive, but that is an option. So you don't have to drive, but there is no public transportation. Thank you. 
and not that convenient sometimes, but, but yeah. Joe. Just briefly, I was shocked when I moved to the area, the lack of uh, express peak hour rides to areas such as Hartford or, or yes, the airport or Boston. It's just like, it seems like a complete lack. Maybe that's, maybe I'm not aware, but we haven't been able to find any. Here is I mean, I mean, traditionally there were more, there was daily service like on Peter Pan from Amherst to Boston and then it went away and they do do direct routes like only related mainly to like student travel. So like on Fridays and Sundays, but it's not a daily service, so. And Eve. So I was gonna say, I, I discovered at some point along the way, I got on a Facebook group for UMass students wanting to do ride shares. And I discovered that that might be why we don't have good transportation linkages because these students were all offering each other rides for $20 to go to and from Boston. So um, I used to live in the Northwest and the state subsidized a pretty good train linkage from Seattle to Eugene. And I, I mean, does the state subsidize Peter Pan at all? Because it seems to me that that would actually be a really useful way to do it long before we have East-West Rail um, to just subsidize a certain number of, of runs and, and to find a way to discourage students from bringing their cars to campus and, and have that be kind of a unified campaign. It would have to be coordinated with UMass, obviously, but I, I think that's sort of ultimately the way we want to be able to go. That's a cool idea, Eve. I have no idea on the subsidy for Peter Pan buses if that's ever happened, but I love the idea. Yeah. And Jessica, did you have another, um, your hand still up? No, sorry. Okay, great. Well, I mean, hasn't in the past sometimes with the express route that will run like the 40 bus that runs between Amherst and Northampton, like weren't some of the express runs like funded with CMAC funds? Sometimes I thought, um, I don't know. So maybe there's some options. All right, last question is, if you could design a transportation system to meet your needs, what would it include? Dream big. <laughs> and this could be considered a catch all as well. This. Seeing it's the last question, uh, and obviously any other comments of items you want us to be aware of. We're gonna go, um, Elise had her hand up first. Um, yeah, and I forgot to tell you that I'm part of the um, DAC committee. Um, I would say more nighttime evening, um, options so that people can go to concerts and and movies and whatever so that's my two cents great thank you and then christine breaststrap i would say more frequent um bus service oh, i have a bus that goes right by my house but i never ride it because it comes at a certain time in the morning and then it comes at noon and then it comes at night but if i wanted to get home, you know, in the middle of the afternoon, that wouldn't be an option. Or if I wanted to leave at different times at night. Um, so I think, you know, more frequent, more flexible bus service would be really important. And I think most of Amherst is covered by bus service, but I bet a lot of people don't ride it because it's not that, not that frequent. And um, Meg? Um, I agree with Chris, and I would add uh, replace many of the buses with vans uh, so that um, the cost is cheaper. We live, uh, one of the things, great things about where we live is right across the street is a bus stop for bus 33 that goes to Stop and Shop, it goes to Big Y, it goes uptown, and often it goes by with two or three people on this huge bus, and it's just hard, it comes often every 35 or 40 minutes. And you can get off at the uptown and wait for it to come back. And it's very, very convenient, but it's such a waste that it's these huge buses and there are very few people that if they had vans instead of buses, it seems they could run more of them. Uh, I mean, literally it goes by every 35 or 40 minutes and sometimes there's nobody on it. It's and the only bus that goes to the survival center, for example. 
It's a really important bus. Eve. So I think the overall vision is that anybody anywhere should be able to take non-car transportation to anywhere they want to go. And they should be able to do it safely, um, affordably, and and if not totally efficiently, then pleasantly, like so that it's it's a ride that feels comfortable. You know what I mean? So I, to me, that's the vision, you know, and we, we basically have that vision for cars that everybody should be able to drive anywhere they want to. Right. So and, and we used to right back in the early 1900s, we had systems of transportation where people could use other forms of transportation to get anywhere they wanted to. I think we need to move back towards that. And that just requires a rethinking of a, of a lot. So that to me, that's the big vision. Good one. <laughs> Incidentally, the only place I've ever seen that is Japan. Uh, and it, it totally exists there. But maybe, wow. maybe that, you know, if, if what we're talking about is, is, is that, you know, the a limitation are our roads. I mean, maybe we convert roads to better walking, biking, pu into public transportation places and put the cars further out. And so we force people, you know, to do those kinds of, of other transportation. I mean, because I can't even bike from here, my home, which is right in the middle of town, uh, over to Hadley Way, which is be safely. And I'm a, I'm a super confident rider. And I really thought twice about doing that at, at um, last night. I did, but it really didn't feel that safe. <laughs> Um, and it's only a mile or two. For me, that's nothing. And Jessica, you have a comment. Yes, I would like to see trolleys everywhere, um, especially down the <laughs> middle of busy streets and down the middle of all of the interstate highways. There should be trains. That there's, there's, we, we privilege <laughs> cars. We should stop doing it. And the roads are for the trucks and everybody should ride on a train. Thank you. <laughs> You said dream big. <laughs> cool. So one of the things I just want to add, when I say anyone, I really mean anyone. So like we need to think not just about adults, um, healthy adults, but about kids, about elderly people, about disabled people, you know, yeah, about people who are uh, racially profiled and may not feel safe on certain kinds of transportation. Like everybody needs to be able to use these modes of transportation, feel safe. <clears throat> well, there's our vision. Well, thank you all. Yeah, does <laughs> any other TAC members have anything to say? I'm moving. Okay, so. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Gary and Miranda for that. And um, so Gary, can you tell us, or Miranda, or both of you, can you tell us a little bit more about the, um, the way the processes will work going forward in terms of developing these plans and further outreach and so on? Yeah, I, I can start with the regional plan. We um, work with the Metropolitan Planning Organization and um, the advisory we have a transportation committee called the Joint Transportation Committee. They meet on the second Wednesday at 10 a.m. of every month. That's their advisory uh, body. So they're the recommending body to our Metropolitan Planning Organization. We will have a draft plan that we will ask the, the MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization, to release in June of this year. And we will be asking that body to endorse the document in July that's kind of the end date when everything has to be endorsed uh, in order for it to be sent over to Federal Highway and Federal Transit for their approval. So over the next few months, we'll be developing uh, many draft chapters and we'll be putting them out through a dedicated link on PVPC's website uh, so that we can get feedback. So our intention is to, to keep the process moving and to start putting out some content, but to, to start getting feedback on that content over the next few months so that you don't have to get this tome 
to look at uh, in May or June when it actually gets released. Okay, right, thank you. So Miranda, not to yeah. put you on the spot about <laughs> some of this, but. No worries. Um, so for the statewide long range plan, I believe um, originally the goal was to have it done in like the summer beginning of the fall, but you know, just given things take time and now we definitely have a new administration, new staff to um, just transition, even though we're positive, a lot of the priorities and goals are the same. Um, the sort of final product should be done by the end of the year. Um, there will definitely be at least one other, like, you know, large public meeting um, and probably some more surveys. Um, if not, you go to the website uh, for the plan. So it's mass.gov slash beyond dash mobility. Um, there's an email there and you can always send that, um, send an email to that. It's monitored by a person, I promise. Um, and, you know, send comments that way. Um, I know Tracy has my email. Um, so um, I'm definitely, I don't pull a lot of strings at MassDOT, but you have a question, you send it to me, I will do my best to get you to someone who can't answer your question or get you some help. Yeah, so as I said, I did share the Beyond Mobility link with the TAC members earlier, um, I guess, and you know, and people can sign up for email lists there and so on. And I'm assuming there'll be a big like publicity push oh, if definitely. you do another survey and things like that. Because I did find the other two surveys like to be really helpful. So, okay, well, thank you both. Thank you so much, it was a great discussion. Great, and Tracy, I'll share the presentation with you again so, so you can distribute it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everybody. Um, I, I, I did want to remind our committee that we have um, nine minutes left. <laughs> Right. So, so I mean, Gary Miranda, you're free to leave if you yeah. want to. Thank you. Me, but thanks. Um, so, if there's a priority um, uh, point that points that we want to get through, we should do that. I mean, I think I mean one main item would just be to just make sure that we're all set with our next meeting, um, the next TAC meeting. And I did just have these few other items. I, I would also like some guidance, um, not to put any on the spot, but if there is any about the questions, you know, in terms of um, the capital um, improvement requests for transportation projects that were any that were made by the citizens or other projects, like if, if there is a role for TAC um, in reviewing those. Um, or if there's any, you know, sort of guidance on that. Like I know that our the tax charge is under revision, which is an ongoing process. Um, there were some questions last year about, you know, whether tax should have weighed in on projects or not. We didn't do that. Um, I do think that providing such feedback does fit under some of our existing charge. It could be interpreted that way. Um, so Andy, if you have any thoughts on that. I am not currently a member of uh, the JCPC. Oh, the JCPC. Oh, okay. But uh, I would encourage you to uh, uh, keep track of what the requests are, because especially after Meg Gage's comments earlier, to be aware of uh, what what the uh, requests that have come in are, and be able to, and, and offer feedback. The council. Um, you know, the JCPC provides a uh, recommendation to the town manager, and then the town manager uses it for the budget process, and it circles back to the council after the town manager proposes the budget, um, which is the 1st of May. So it's really a joint process that involves both the, um, the administrative end and the council end. Um, but I would encourage you to uh, at least contact the chair of uh, either through the finance director um, or the chair of uh, JCPC and uh, be able to find out what has been requested and 
to offer comments as a committee, I think they would be appreciated. I mean, so Guilford, are you, I mean, I know it seemed the red line for citizen requests was December 31st. You know, there was a Google form that was available until then. Um, I mean, Guilford, do you have information on the citizen request or? No, I have no clue. Come in? Okay. I have no clue how they're doing it. And um, yeah. All right. So, because we don't, um, Andy, we're, we're, I mean, except for, um, you know, Meg reaching out. And I haven't, I guess it sounds like Meg sent some information to TAC and I haven't received like that email yet or anything. So I don't think so, but. Um, JCPC um, hasn't really met yet because um, they usually, they meet frequently, but it's usually February and March that are their heavy meeting schedule where they're meeting weekly. And uh, so it, it is a good time to be thinking about this question so that as JCPC forms and gets active for the year that um, you request that they let you know what has been requested and allow <clears throat> and so that you can make your comments. And I will pass it along to through uh, people that I work with on the finance committee side. Okay, thank you. I mean, Guilford, do you see that that could that be something on our future agendas? I mean, will that information come to the DPW about what the request have been? Or, or how does that usually go? Usually the we get for the citizen request, we get asked questions like, is the number right? Do you think this is the right? What would you what do you think? Um, and that's about it. Um, it's really, I guess it's really a question if you want to ask Paul when you talk to Paul, because he'll probably tell you a little more. All right. Yeah, I mean, I was told, um, I received an email um, from Sean McGonagall that said, that so one of the things is the Google form that for the citizen request it did have a section where um, the requesters could indicate if there had been any endorsement by any committees or anything. So I have heard from a few people just asking, you know, we'll tack review, we'll tack endorse, and so on because that was part of the form. Um, and I did reach out to Sean Mangano after I received, um, you know, some requests on that. And what I heard from him is that it would be you know, up to the town manager and yourself to decide, you know, if any of them come back to tax. So if any of them considered, so I guess it's still to be determined, but, but as an advisory committee, we could advise if uh, asked to do so. So. Yeah. I mean, you can actually just take the whole, once it comes out as a list, you could take them all, take them all and look at them if you want to. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Okay. Thanks. So to be continued, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what the time frame is, you know, for that. I guess uh, we can check in with hope maybe by our next meeting or something, right? Because well, the deadline Andy, had passed. I mean, Andy's right. There hasn't been okay. There hasn't been a formal presentation. This is the projects that have been requested or so forth. Got yeah. it. Got it. Okay, so um, so just before we are like only two minutes away from seven, I know we like to end punctually. Um, so we typically are meeting on the first and the third Thursdays, um, you know, at 530. Does that seem like that still works for all the members who are here today? Yeah. I mean, I know Marcus can usually attend. He just had a conflict um, with today. And I guess we'll have to figure out what's happening with Tate. And so... And um, and Chris Lindstrom was here, but she sometimes needs to leave by six thirty. So, um, I mean, we can. I mean, I think we'll keep it as is for now. But I know sometimes if we end up being on the same meeting days as the TSO meeting, right? Then Andy's not as available, and then we also need to like end our meetings quickly. So, if you know, if we want to explore having a different time, like going back to five thirty or. I mean, to back to five or some something. But. 
Well, let's talk about it next time. So our next meeting is <clears throat> the 19th. 19th at 530. 530. Okay. That work? Yeah. Yeah. And I will say just there's other items that I had on the agenda, you know, in terms of the GOL review of the snow and ice bylaw. They didn't get to it at their last meeting, which was yesterday. And there was um and the second item was there was that evening walk um with the district four counselors and the town manager was there. And um there was a little bit of TV coverage and Jim Russell from uh the Republican was there. And it was in four, and we just short, but um, it seemed pretty successful. Unfortunately, it wasn't downpouring, and they were talking about doing it again in District Four, and maybe looking, you know, encouraging other counselors to do them in their districts as well. So, to be continued. But if, it, if for people in other districts, you can always, you know, reach out to your counselors and see if there's interest in that. Because I find it really valuable to actually like walk. You know some of these corridors in different conditions you know in the snow or in the ice or in the dark and see what is actually there on the ground which is things you might not notice if you just drive by them every day and that's how it felt um when we were doing it yesterday okay all right well i guess we're at seven uh and we don't have bruce on our committee anymore we're going to need to have a new person to um adjourn the meetings <laughs> does does do any of our committee members want to do that i uh, well okay all right well i will um make a motion to adjourn the meeting a second all right okay thank you thank thanks, you everyone thanks, thanks, everybody. thanks to our visitors okay bye. thank you very much glad you could make it you too